thank you everybody for joining us tonight. So tonight we're going to start part one of Catholic Mythbusters, right? What keep about the Catholic Church and what the truth really is. So I'm just going to... Uh, right? Right? So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good gracious God, we thank you for all that you've given us and continue to give us. Open our minds tonight and our hearts so that we can learn more about you, our faith, our church, ourselves, as we continue down this journey that you set for us and began for us so long ago. We know that you provide for us a path to salvation, but along the way there have been some bumps, some walls, some things thrown at us, but we must remain steadfast in our faith in you and your church, so that in the end, we are granted that greatest gift of all, eternal life in the kingdom of God. And we ask this through Christ our Lord, amen, amen. in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, four parts. Basically, the outline for tonight is bigger picture. Um, we as Catholics, the church, uh, and the clergy, the pope and priests. Next week will be uh, the sacraments and doctrine. The following week will be historical attacks and myths. And the following week, last week, I have decided to kind of go after the modern day controversial issues that people even within the church fight about. Because if we don't talk about it, we're going to just have arguments over things that we don't know. So I'd rather just put out the information and give you the sources for it. So that'll be... So anyone who did not get one of the handouts, we have some more. Uh, on the table that they can grab on the way out. So everything that's here up on the screen is in there as well, and some sources um, for you to look into. Uh, so like I said that last week, we are gonna go after the controversial issues, the ones that are um, pertinent to us today, especially in the political, social, cultural atmosphere. So some of the things that we're gonna talk about today, um, some are pertinent to us today, some are historical in, in context. Some have evolved, and we're going to get into that. Uh, once I go through the slides and some of the issues, tonight if we can stick to the questions uh, on church, clergy, the Pope, and, and us. And then each week we'll kind of have the questions about that week's topic. All right? So, Catholic Mythbusters. church. There are millions of people who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church, which is, of course, quite a different thing. Now, when this was said in 1938, okay, I would argue was at the beginning of the end, if you will, at least in this country, of the Catholic-Protestant animosity, okay? Basically, after Vatican II, the Catholic, uh, Protestant, mainline Protestant animosity really diminished in this country. However, it's been replaced by evangelical and uh, literalist versus Catholic, okay? So the mantle of that mantra has been picked up, not by mainstream Protestants, but by evangelical literalists Biblicalists. So it still remains, but in a different uh, outline. We, of course, now in this country are the majority, we are the largest religion in the United States. Okay? In this country, we have 60 million Catholics. Do you know what the second largest faith group is? Non practicing Catholics. <laughs> Okay? <laughs> On average, about 40 million of those 20, 60 million do not practice their faith 
on a regular basis. That still makes us the largest faith group in the United States. We are a uh, uh, plurality. Another side note, and this is in the news right now with the Supreme Court, okay? The Supreme Court has always been a bastion of Protestantism in this country. For the first time ever, there are no Protestants on the Supreme Court. There are six Catholics, three Jews. Okay? And so if Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh I think his name is, if he's put on, he is Catholic, it'll remain six Catholics, three Jews, no Protestants. How things have changed. Okay? But this still remains. What people perceive about the Catholic Church here in the United States and the world is very different from the reality. And as I said to you before, time and time again, the, one of the beauties of the Catholic Church is that we write everything down, okay? But nobody reads it, all right? Everything is written down. So these perceptions are even worse because they have the ability to learn it, and we don't, Catholics included. So, first question. Are Catholics Christians? Now this might sound crazy, but this is a major issue in our world today. Because when it was Catholic first Pro uh, Protestant, if you will, we all considered each other Christians. Okay? The basis of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Alright? Today, however, when you hear someone says, I'm a Christian, typically they are not a member of a mainstream Protestant church. They're not Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist. Um, they are typically evangelical. Okay? And they do not see Catholics as Christians. They see us as a separate faith. I don't know if we worship the God of Catholic or something. I don't know what it is. But they do not see us as Christians because of the hierarchy, because of the sacraments. They do not see us as Christians. And so here's a, uh, an article from uh, Dr. Uh, Father uh, Vonnecker. It is a difficult question to answer, not because there is no answer, but because the answer is so obvious. Yet, if the question is being asked to you, realize that the inquirer, that the that the inquirer is not uh, to the inquirer is not obvious at all. In fact, you realize that the person asking the question is only doing so because he already truly believes that Catholics are not Christians. This is what we're running into. So when you hear Church of So and So or the Assembly of Sodra, all these like non-mainstream Protestants, they don't see us as Christians, which is mind-blowing. So we need to explain, because as the definition is that we with, share with Protestants are, we believe in a triune God, uh, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that through the Incarnation, He redeemed the world and opened the path to the Kingdom of Heaven uh, through His resurrection. And as a disciple, that is what we, how we are called Christians. Their definition is, you know, that they've been saved. They've accepted Jesus Christ as their per personal Lord and Savior, and that they've been saved. The problem with this definition is that there's no objectivity to it. What does it mean to accept Jesus Christ in your heart and to get saved, or accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? What does that mean? They don't have a doctrine. They don't have uh, a set faith like we do. It's very individualized. Whereas we are a community of believers made up of individuals. But this is something that we are confronting, particularly in the United States, Christian versus Catholic. And so when, you, when someone says that to you, oh, I'm Christian, so am I, what denomination are you? They usually can't answer because they don't belong to a denomination. They just consider themselves this genetic Christian. So this is a major thing that we're having um, difficulty in theology, 
and, and politics, all this kind of stuff, because there is nobody to talk to on that side. There's nobody to talk to. On the Catholic side, you have structure. You have people to talk to. Um, but this is a, an issue that we need to see, that when you see this on TV, and they, this person, the pastor of so-and-so, he doesn't look at you as a Christian. He doesn't look at you as a Christian. Um, therefore, you're not saved in their eyes. Yeah. So, uh, we are Christian. Uh, that's, you know, so don't believe in that myth. Uh, we are Christian. We believe in the triune God. We recognize Christ as our Lord and Savior. But that we cooperate with that mission um, towards the path of salvation. It's not simply faith alone. It's faith and works. That is our, our, our doctrine. Faith and living out the life of a disciple of Christ. So yes, we are Christians. Ah, here's the fun one. Is Rome the whore of Babylon? And therefore, the Catholic Church. This is an old-time accusation that uh, reared its head most prevalently uh, during the Reformation, okay? So, going back to ancient times, you had what was this myth about a, uh, a source of evil uh, and anything you know, that was the source of evil, the empire that was against the good of humanity. And then in Revelation, it speaks of the seven-headed dragon, okay? And the woman that will ride upon it. And then, in Revelation 17, 9, here's a clue for the one who has wisdom. The seven heads represent seven hills upon which the woman sits. Whoa, Rome has seven hills. That must mean that Rome is the whore of Babylon. Well, yes and no. So historically, scholars have agreed that when this was written, that Rome was who it spoke of. But it was the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, not Rome, and therefore then the church. Revelation would not call the church that it represents the whore of Babylon. However, Let's go forward 1,500 years, I you have the Protestant Reformation. Now, anytime you want to break off from a group, right, what do you want to do to the other group? Undermine them, destroy them, make them, you know, uh, the wrong group. So immediately, the Protestants turn to Scripture and then apply this directly to the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church. So if you remained in the church, you were part of the evil empire that was there to destroy humanity, not help save it. Well, to the average person, that sounds like a good reason to get out, right? This goes all the way up to today, but again, as I said before, not as much coming from mainstream Protestants, but from evangelicals. So, 1994, David Hunt writes a book, A Woman Rides the Beast. And part of his, one of his quotes is, Against only one other city in history could a charge of fornication be leveled. That city is Rome, and more specifically, Vatican City. Okay? Now, Let's tie the Reformation of the 1500s to this date. On the left here, we see this picture. That is a German picture. Remember, the Reformation started in Germany, okay? This is from the 15th century, and it shows a woman on top of the seven-headed dragon. And how do we know that she represents the Catholic Church? What's she wearing? the papal tiara, okay? Because the church has always been referred to in the feminine, right? Holy Mother Church, and then the papal tiara. And then, of course, the reality is, 
that in the 1930s, the concordat between Italy and the Vatican and the church, Vatican City was created. Outside the walls of Rome, on the Vatican Hill. But this guy here specifically says Vatican City, as if it existed prior to 1933, okay? And makes that jump to the Catholic Church, that this accusation of the Whore of Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church. And so the battle goes back and forth today between Protestants and Catholics or evangelicals. Most people don't realize that Vatican City, built squarely on Vatican Hill, isn't one of the seven hills for which Rome was famous. Unfortunately, for the, for the fevered anti-Catholic theories that David Hunt and others traffic in, the Catholic Church's headquarters, Vatican City, sits on the other side of the Tiber River, not on any of the seven hills. The Tiber formed a natural boundary for the city limits of ancient Rome. The seven hills were on the other side, snug inside the city walls. Vatican Hill sits across the river, in sight of the old city, but not technically part of it. So close yet so far. So this fight is still happening to this very day, okay? That we are still called, essentially, the Whore of Babylon, the seat of evil, seeking out to destroy humanity, not save it. The new attackers, though, have moved from Protestants to Evangelicals. Just to show you, we actually have a pictorial proof. This is Vatican City, the Tiber River, and then the city of Rome. And so people choosing words and making associations mean something. So when you jump from Rome, the city, to Vatican City, which is the headquarters of our church, you're making a direct attack against the church. You're not saying Rome the city is the whore of Babylon or the Holy Roman Empire, or the Roman Empire. You're saying the Roman Catholic Church. This is what people are saying about us to this very day. The Pope. Okay? This is one of my favorite ones, right? So does anybody know what this picture is from? Wizard of Oz, right? So, the Pope has become basically the face of the Catholic Church, of the earthly church, right? And particularly in the last hundred years, as communication has greatly improved, the Pope has become the centerpiece, the face of the church, okay? Literally, prior to the mid-19th mid century, no one outside of Italy ever knew what the Pope looked like. They might have known his name. Or there might have been a couple Popes before they found out who the next Pope was, because of communication. But they surely didn't know what he looked like, okay, until photography was developed. And then as time went on through the 20th century, radio, television, and now the internet, okay? As we talked about before, you know, Fulton Sheen was a great proponent of the radio and television. That's how we got to know him. Otherwise, he would have been just another priest who would have been famous maybe locally, but because of media, got his name and, and message out. So the same has happened here with the Pope. Now, who is the head of the Roman Catholic Church? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay. The Pope is the head of the earthly church. Big difference. He is the vicar of Christ. Okay? He is not Christ. But what's happened is, for both Catholics and non-Catholics, he has become the great and all-powerful. That whatever he says goes, no matter who he is. Whether he's conservative, a liberal, whatever it is, that whatever he says goes. He is the church. Simply not true. So the myth, don't Catholics have to accept everything the Pope says and act like he does in order to be a good and faithful Catholic? 
Because this is what you hear in the media all the time. Well, Pope so-and-so said this, or he did this. Therefore, you must do it. You must believe it. Okay? Not the case. The reason I put this picture up, this picture is Pope Alexander VI. Anybody know who he is? The Borgia Pope? Okay? Several children out of wedlock, of course. Uh, his grandson became, is now recognized as a saint within the Catholic Church. Uh, he bought, he potentially murdered his way to the papacy. Okay? So, do we follow him if, he does, if we, the Pope does that? Right? Uh, but again, this whole kind of mythical understanding of the office of Pope has developed. And unfortunately, even within the church, the political development has occurred. Okay, if we're going to be honest, right? So, last Pope Benedict XVI, perceived as a conservative, traditionalist, so if you liked him, you pointed to him. Look what he's saying, look what he's doing, look what he's wearing. And you gotta do that. More progressive in Francis, if you like that, look what he's doing, look what he's saying. He's the Pope now, that's what we gotta do. No, that's not. That's his personal preference in a lot of those things. Okay? In the type of mass he celebrates, what he wears, certain aspects like that are personal preference. Just like I as a priest have personal preference, should I choose to wear different vestments. And it's not the way you have to do it, it's an option. We as Catholics also have different levels of assent, okay? Which means that when something is taught by the church, there are certain levels to which we have to ascend, ascend to that to that doctrine or teaching. If it's dogma, it is full assent, no questions. You cannot have any doubts. Okay, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, dogma. You can't say mm, no. I just don't like the Father and the Son. <laughs> no, no, you don't have that ability. Okay, but there are things that come down the line, if you will that you can have dissent and personal uh, struggles with, okay? Particularly when you get to discipline. As an example, the married priesthood, right? This is a discipline that the church has. It is not part of a doctrine. It is not part of our faith. It is not essential to our faith. But it is a practice. It is a, uh, a, a discipline that we've had Officially on the books since Trent, but going all the way back to the apostles. Are there married priests in the Roman Catholic Church? Yes. Yes, yes there are. Okay? And will there be in the future? Yes, there will be. It could, in theory, they could change that discipline to allow married priests. That and, and you as individuals, as Catholics, have that right to discuss that, okay? And to have a personal opinion on something like discipline. So another accusation that's been thrown at us is that we are mindless guppies, okay? Historically, that Catholics just do what they're told, all right? That we don't think, okay? Not the case. Or again, in the reality, not the case. We do have those abilities, but within limits and understanding. Not everything is on the table. Certain things are, certain things aren't. But a discipline like that, you can have a personal opinion. How far you take it, how public you take it, that's where the issue becomes, okay? So, we do not follow everything that the Pope says or does, okay? Because there's a difference between infallibility and impeccability, okay? Papal infallibility means that the Pope, when pronouncing definitively and dogmatically on matters of faith and morals, is protected 
from teaching errors. When something is declared infallible, the Pope must say it as definitive, and he must do it what's called ex cathedra, from the seat of Peter, in an official manner, officially, okay? And it cannot be anything outside of faith or morals. So he can't say, the sky is now green. You must believe it. I am the Pope. No, that doesn't fall within faith and morals. Can anybody, so the dogma of infallibility, okay, was defined in 1870, okay, in 1870, but has always been a papal prerogative, but did not have to be defined until 1870, okay? Does anybody know the two things within the last 150 years that have been defined dogmatically through infallibility? Matholic conception and the assumption. The assumption. Okay. Um, rumor has it, if you will, uh, that, and it, this has been going on for years, that the next one might be um, Humana Vitae, to declare that dogmatic. The the document put out in 1968 against contraception, okay? That is a doctrine, that is a very high, high um, ascent level, but it's not dogma, okay? That is, has always been rumored, um, that might be something declared uh, as infallible. Right now it's a doctrine of the church, not a dogma. Infallibility is not the same as impeccability or the ability, or the inability to sin. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ and His Blessed Mother are impeccable. The Pope is a sinner. Our humble Pope, this person like Benedict, uh, would be the first to admit it. This is when this was made. So, the Pope is still a sinner. He's a human being. The office he holds is guided by the Holy Spirit. And remember, Pope, okay, the, the office of Pope is actually i say this right, uh, secondary, if you will. What is he actually elected as? No, not you. No. <laughs> Bishop of Rome. Bishop of Rome. And so as elected as Bishop of Rome becomes Pope, Papa of the Universal Church. So no one is elected Pope. They're actually elected to the Bishop of Rome. Um, so we, we actually have, and this is a historic, we have on earth today, in essence, the oldest democracy in history. I mean, we've had 400 and something popes all elected, guided through the Holy Spirit, even with Alexander. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but they are all um, people. They are prone to sin, okay? But when they act through infallibility, they cannot sin. So, just as a recent controversy, if you will, last year I think it was, um, and this comes up every year, uh, on Holy Thursday, washing the feet, okay? The book, the book says, 12 men shall be called forward to wash their feet. That is what we are supposed to do. It doesn't say if you want to do that, you have the option to, if they're available. He then goes and has, Francis, children and Muslims, and has their feet washed. And then almost every church in this country had people coming up, we need to do the same thing. He did it, we gotta do it. No, no we don't. The book says 12 men. That's what happened in scripture. So, just because the Pope does something, doesn't mean we have to follow it. Now, pastorally, that can make an issue within a parish. And so the priest has to decide whether he wants to fight that battle. But he has the rules and regs on his side. The book says 12 men, as an example. So, again, just because the Pope says something. And then, of course, with media today, 
We have the infamous, what is, what is uh, Francis' most known quote? Who am I a judge, right? Completely taken out of context. Completely taken out of context. And that's become the catchphrase that everyone now uses to let everyone do what they want. Pope Francis said, who am I to judge? Does anybody actually know what the context of what he said that on the plane? Anybody else? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, it was about homosexuals living a celibate lifestyle. As priests. Okay. Homosexual priests. There's actually a question on homosexual priests. Can they fulfill their office and their holy orders um, if they are homosexual uh, and priests? And he said, who am I to judge whether a person is called to holy orders and can live a celibate life or not simply because they're homosexual? That was the actual context of what he said. But what was reported? Who am I to judge? And, or, and it's become now anything. So we as Catholics have to understand that there's limits to the papacy. And we have to understand that when someone says, you know, oh, the Pope said this, therefore we must believe it and do it, that may not be the case. He is a moral leader, absolutely. But when it gets into specific things, not always are we, do we have to assent to it, whether he's conservative, liberal, whatever it is. But by knowing our faith and knowing the limits and understandings of these things, we can help other people understand the papacy and our church as well. But like I said, he is a man, he is prone to sin, just like the rest of us. So, the catechism, again, we write down everything. The catechism, uh, big scary book, right? 900 pages. It's a great resource, okay? Every Catholic should have a catechism in their house. If you don't have one, the next best thing is called the compendium to the catechism. The compendium was put out after this, which was a best bestseller, actually. It sold over two million copies um, throughout the world. So, uh, but there was a lot of people that, oh, that was a lot of words. So they did a compendium, which is a synthesis, and they did it actually in kind of the, um, the Q&A style, like the uh, Baltimore Catechism. It's 500 questions. And so, and then they break it down by topic, morals, doctrine, and so forth. You know, uh, how, how do we see, how do we understand Mary? And then a one paragraph statement uh, as to how we see Mary and understand Mary, let's say. So the compendium is a great resource to start first, then go to the catechism um, to get it deeper, and then the catechism shows you the primary sources. So go read that. And all the sources are online, vatican.va for free. So if you've got nothing to do on a Tuesday, print off one of those dogmas and just have at it. So the Roman Pontiff, the College of Bishops, the group of the bishops of the world, I don't remember the exact number, but today there are approximately 5,000 bishops, okay? When Vatican II was called, there was over 2,500 bishops. And to this very day, it still holds the uh, Guinness World Record of the largest meeting ever held. The largest meeting of an organization ever held. Because they're from all over the world and the number of people. So if one were held today, there would be over 5,000 official delegates at the meeting. Again, definitive act, supreme magisterium, so that's the bishops with the pope, particularly in the council. Ecumenical council. Now, ecumenical, okay, ecumenism in today's world is seen as dialogue between the denominations. Ecumenical means members of the whole, okay, because it's the whole church that comes together, the official church, the Roman Catholic Church. So they are the official representatives and official leadership uh, through the bishops. Obedience of faith versus religious assent. Okay, so the, the ecumenical council with the pope has dogmatic authority. When they declare something, we as Catholics follow it. 
the bishops, okay, the ordinary magisterium, may interpret certain things, but it doesn't hold the same authority. Okay, it doesn't hold the same authority upon us. So again, this myth that we just blatantly follow whatever someone in a collar says is simply not true. Okay, um, an individual bishop can be corrected from the Vatican when it becomes an issue of interpretation. So there is corrective um, methods. But the catechism really can help us understand our faith uh, uh, to better defend it for ourselves against, again, Catholics and non-Catholics. The priest. <laughs> All right, bonus question. What picture is this from? What TV show? What? Father Ted. Father Ted. One of my favorite shows. Uh, it was a British comedy. Uh, it lasted, unfortunately, only uh, one season because Father Ted in the middle actually died in real life. Yeah. Um, Dougal, Father Ted, and Father Jack. Um, Dougal was an idiot. Um, Father Jack, uh, Father Ted, the reason he is sent to this uh, craggy island, this like horrible place in, in Ireland, um, is because he took all the, pa the backstory is, he took all the parish funds, went to Las Vegas, <laughs> lost it all, and so as punishment, they put him up on this island uh, with the idiot and the drunk. Um, and so it's a great comedy. It only lasted one season, but I highly recommend for a good laugh. Adults only. It is BBC, so they actually have a little higher tolerance of uh, comedy. But the priest, right? The priest is the local face of the church, right? For Catholics and non-Catholics alike. And now that I'm a priest, I get to see and live some of the myths um, that people have about us. Um, and clearing up some of the myths that I had about the priesthood, you know? So, This is one of my myths that I had, that you know, when a person was called to the priesthood, they were perfect. Uh, from the moment they were born, God knew, and uh, you know, they just kind of knew that they were gonna priest, be a priest, and they went off onto this mountain, and uh, were made priest, and came back, uh, and, and, and say la vie. But I quickly found out that's not true. Um, because he called me. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, the, 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 the perfect part's out. Um, seminary is a bit of a bubble, I will tell you that. They, you know, we do get removed from the reality of parish life uh, and of life, uh, and then come back and are thrown into this. Um, but we, we go up the mountain, as I said, a sinful man, and we come down the mountain, a sinful man. You know, we're not perfect. I've had friends tell me, okay, oh, Chris, you can do whatever you want. You've got a one-way ticket to heaven. You're a priest. I'm like, I wish it was that way. Uh, I go, no. I've said this to you before, maybe, um, and one of the reasons that we wear black, right, we die to self, that when we are ordained, that our life is no longer about us. It is about serving Christ and his people. And so we wear black to show that anyone that we encounter, that they know that I don't live for myself, I live for you. And I'm at your service. But the white, the collar, is to remind me that I have a soul that still will be judged like everyone else. So it's to remind me that I am no better, I am no different than everyone else that I serve. So symbolically outward and inward, what we wear. And so we go up a sinful man, we come down a sinful man, and together we go along the path towards salvation. Hopefully. So, can I tell you a little secret? This is probably one of the biggest things that I've come to realize. People think that anything that they say to a priest is under the seal of confession. It's not, okay? 
but this is the public perception, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, okay, that whatever you say to a priest, and this is also pertains to, to a lesser extent, but a lot of people think whatever I say to a lawyer, right, is under that, but it's not, but all the more so with the priest. And so when someone comes up to me and says, Father, I need to talk to you about something, I have to quickly say to them and defend them and say, is this confession? Oh no, okay, then I know that it's not confession. Now. Whether they know or understand that if they say something to me that is a crime or reportable, I must do if it's told to me outside of confession. That even means in spiritual direction. Spiritual direction, one-on-one, -on -one, the seal remains to a certain extent unless harm to self or harm to others. Okay? Now, here's the key. The word harm, very broadly defined, okay? Particularly in today's world. Most people jump, oh, that means physical. Not always. Again, I'm a high school chaplain. Where does most of the bullying occur? Online, cyberbullying. So something like that, if it were to come to me outside of confession, particularly since it is with a minor, I have to report it, okay? This actually came to a head only a few months ago in Erie, Pennsylvania, okay? Guy went to the rectory, wanted to speak to a priest, young priest, said, okay, sits down. Father, I gotta tell you something, okay? I just killed my wife. Stay right here. <laughs> I'm gonna go next door. He called the police and he was arrested. Now here's the problem. I looked at easily a dozen articles in mainstream, local, and, and New York, Philadelphia, uh, newspapers and, and, and uh, television. All of them said, man arrested for murder after confessing to priest. But it wasn't a confession, okay? So they, now he was attacked left and right from people because they thought he broke the seal. And he had to get out there and explain to people, that's not the way it was perceived by me. He did not say I'm in confession. And so there is no understanding that simply because you tell me something, I'm gonna keep it. So that's a really, really important thing. And with the seal, the within the sacrament of confession, reconciliation, it's a very odd uh, uh, sacrament in the sense that if both people are on the same page from the get-go, believe it's confession, the seal exists. So for instance, if I'm sitting in the confessional, person comes in and they go through the motions, right? Forgive me, Father, if I have sinned, it's been, you know, oh, forever, you know, I might get that all the time. <laughs> uh, since my last confession, okay. Does a confession, and, and let's say some big ones, right? Uh, illegal as well, forget about some moral, but illegal. And I absolve them. And then at the end, they go, oh, I really need to get that off my chest. We don't do that in my church. What do you mean? Like, which Catholic church is not offering confession? Oh, I'm not Catholic, I'm Lutheran, but I know that you guys do this, so I want, the seal exists, the seal exists, because I assumed, and the way they did it, we were both under the assumption that there was confession, okay? So, if someone now, let's say in the beginning, oh, Father, I'm not Catholic, but I wanted to come talk to you, I have to tell them, Whatever you say to me, if illegal or needed to be reported, I will report this, okay? But there's this perception out there that whatever is said to a Catholic priest is under the seal, not the case. So if you do intend to tell something to the priest, let them know, Father, this is under the seal. 
so that they will then talk to you and understand that uh, going forward. So, next week, a little teaser. The sacraments. Are Catholics cannibals? This is an oldie but a goodie. Because what do we say? We eat the body and blood of Christ. And if you're a Protestant, and you don't want your kids to become Catholic, what do you do? If you go there, they're gonna eat you. That's what they used to say. Because what do we do? The sacrifice of the Mass. This is the kind of stuff that used to be said. It's an oldie but a goodie. Doctrine, we're gonna talk about some doctrine. Purgatory, we don't talk about, we don't believe in that one anymore, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. We might not talk about it that much, but we do believe it. There's been a lot of things that people have thought have gone off the wayside since Vatican II as officially no longer taught. That's not the case. We may not talk about it that much, but it's not off the books. It's still part of our faith. So those are the kind of things I want to talk about next week. Um, I'll have lots of good information on those. There will be some fun ones, uh, some historical stuff with the primarily Catholic, Protestant back and forth in these kind of things. Uh, but even today, with Catholics understanding the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist, um, is, is one of our major issues that we are confront, uh, confronting today. So, that's where we're going to end for tonight. Any questions for the topics that we talked about tonight? <laughs>